Jason, thank you for coming today. Welcome to my kitchen. Uh, I bought your present, like everybody. This do you, oh. red wine. Do you, do you, Mate, do you, I'm a massive red wine. Oh, fan. are you? Oh, yeah. good. Oh, good. That's okay. Awesome. Excellent. I was wondering whether you're drunk or not. Um, yeah. uh, what? <laughs> how, how does drinking work when you're in the army? When you're actually out in the actual um, war zone, do you, do you dr ever get your hands on alcohol at all out there? Officially, no. <laughs> <laughs> we had me. There is means and ways of doing it, but yeah, officially, you, you, it is quite dry when you're away on those trips. It's it's like a health farm with a bit of a stressful underlying tone to it, but. You don't normally drink on the odd occasion that we're not working, which is very odd. We now manage to get involved with a little bit of booze. So when you come home and you have time off, heavy, yeah. heavy drinking? Yeah, it's quite the, the military. It was, it's not so much now, but the military was, especially when I first joined, is a very, it's a bit too boozy. There's right. a big drinking culture. So, yeah, you'd come back. I suppose all those jobs with stress were or are, like the force, the police forces and all it's that just, sort of I, I suppose it's a vent, isn't it? It is a, a sort of a vent. Yeah. It's not a great one, but, I mean, you'd be away. So, like, you'd go away for six months and you'd come back. Obviously, you're a military guy. You'd come back and you genuinely think you're like a pop star because you're like, I haven't spent money for six months. What am I going to do with this? And so what do you do? You go and buy a load of that and get, right. and get, yeah, get smashed up. Uh, you're here talking about your book, which I just said to you, actually, it's really interesting because I picked it up and I thought it's going to be a normal SAS book. You yeah. know, look at me. I've taken on 100 people and <laughs> killed them all single handedly and I've been tortured and everything else. I love those books, by the way. There's nothing against them. But um, I'd, I'd written a whole load of questions all about um, the mental side of war and being in the SAS. And you've answered so many in the book. I've got to say, brilliant read. Loved it. Thank haven't, you. Haven't put it down. Response to the book been good? So far, yeah. I mean... Yeah, so far, so good. Today was the release, so we'll, we'll wait and see, but it's been okay. Different different way of looking at it, though. You you open yourself up a lot in this book. Mm, I mean, it's it's been two years. It's taken us two years, and when I first... I didn't know whether I wanted to write a book, and a friend of mine, Matt, who's actually the writer, he said, you know, I think it would be a good thing for you to do. And I said, right, okay, maybe but I don't want it to be a war story where we talk about all the hero, heroic, glorified things to do with war. I wanted it to be my emotional journey and then my my sort of, not struggle, but just my journey with, with mental health, you know, PTSD, yeah. uh, depression, what they called chronic burnout. And yeah, it, we've, managed to, we've managed to do it. Yeah, but you, you also managed to make me feel very anxious which is good. I did. Cause, yeah, you did because it's, it's that great thing of when you're... It's, it's, I like the format of it because it's your thought process It keeps on coming in between the story, what you're actually thinking about. And I'm feeling anxious for you. And I think that's a great thing. I think you managed to capture war well mm -hmm. or combat battle. I'm not sure which way to describe it. But <clears throat> when you're about to go and do something and you're going and you're sort of... Uh, saying I'm scared now or I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with this it's mm. like are you thinking, oh my god you're about to go and do something where you could potentially die and you, and, <laughs> yeah, you know because we yeah. always have the assumption that you guys just don't care you're immune to it all yeah well that's that's what I wanted to get across is the fact that it's just we are you know the people that do that still do that job now we've got friends that are still in it me other people that have left now they're just normal blokes that just yeah. end up doing that job um, yeah there's, you've got to have a bit of a you got to have something, I don't know what, well, I sort of hazard a guess at what to do the job, but again, you're just still a normal bloke that does some crazy stuff every now and again. Six years since you've been in? Yeah. Miss it? No, not now. I did. I, feel like I did 20 years and I obviously medically discharged for PTSD yeah. and I was, that was probably two or three years short of my career finishing. So I thought I, I sort of felt a bit shortchanged at, at the beginning, and I missed it. And it, when I now look at it, it's not so much the job itself, which was cool, but it was it is more the the identity that goes with it, the belonging. It's not dissimilar to you know any other job really. If you've done it for a long time and loved it, and it's a career, once you do come out of the back end of it and finish it. You miss bits of it, and it's normally the camaraderie. Yeah, you you, you um, make the comparison with footballers. Yeah, I would suggest it's pretty much the same. Yeah, dressing room. Yeah, because I've, I've I did soccer around for years, so mm. I met lots of ex-footballers, and they can never replace that. 
bit where they get up and they meet up with all their mates no. every day and they play football and when they're on that pitch for 90 minutes they're desperately trying to get a result and mm. they're training during the week they can't replace it they no. really struggle but it's just, it, it is almost apart from the dynamic of the two jobs it is very similar because they're mm. also putting themselves under a lot of stress when they're doing that job because they 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 have to perform, don't they? And that, that in itself is a stress, and it's the same with the job I did. I think yours is harder. I'm <laughs> honest with you. Well, I don't, they're, yeah. they're in I'm like the 150 grand a week could have, you know, yeah, that would have been all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they're in nightclubs and <laughs> it, those, some of those vulgar cars and stuff. You know, yeah. it's like you know, I think I'd rather uh, do their job than yours. Yeah. Um, right, what age did you get in? Why? Well, not what age? Well, I, I joined the Marines at 16. And that was, there was two reasons. Uh, firstly, I grew up in Luton and somehow I knew I needed to get out of there because I was going to go down a, a, the wrong path. And secondly, my dad was in the Marines years and years and years ago, but it influenced me to a certain degree. What do you mean the wrong path? What that led to? I, just, I didn't grow up in a great, it wasn't in a great place. Um, I was probably easily led. Right. Uh, I didn't do very well at school. In fact, I didn't do very well. I was shocking and... I was more of an outdoorsy person, bit of sport. I like that, so I figured, right, I'll join the join the military, yeah. join the Marines. Um, what age did you get in the SAS then? Twenty five. So I did about nine years. Then what happened was, I enjoyed being. I enjoyed being a soldier. I just didn't enjoy a lot of the bullshit that went with it. Right. So there's a lot of the pomp and ceremony. I'm not, I'm not good at like getting dressed up for parades, walking through London, and I look like I look a bag of. Yeah, I don't look good I can never dress up smart in that stuff and I didn't really like it I didn't like the sort of the admin that went with it but I did enjoy being a soldier I like rolling around in the dirt and just being a kid really so I figured if I was going to do it continue doing it then what what should I do right okay join the special forces so so 25 you get in mm -hmm. is that when you actually officially become SAS or, or do you then train for how long no you do you say so you, you put in to do selection start there's 350 of us started and then if you get to the end, which is about nine months later, six months to nine months later, you're, that's you. you. You finish and you join this squad. I think there was ten of us that finished ours. Wow, yeah, it's a bit mad. Yeah. What? What? So, what? What does it take to become um, good SAS? Uh, There's an amalgamation of a few things. You need to be stubborn. You need to have a little bit of. You've got to be physically robust. Um, psychologically robust with regard to how you deal with certain things I say that now having suffered from PTSD um, you need to have a flexible mindset be able to you know roll with the punches so to speak so if something doesn't go to plan don't freak out about it and then you've got to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations so what, what, one of my favourite bits of your book by the way was when you're out at the end yeah. And you start talking about working in normal environment. Um, I've had Megan Hine on. Do you know Megan Hine? She, no. oh, she does all the survival stuff on TV shows. A bit yeah, like, yeah. A bit like you, you sort of did for a while and stuff like that. And so, you know, and she's, she's a good sort of, sort of survival expert and stuff. And she changed my life a bit. Actually, your book's very like this because you start thinking about actually what it takes to survive rather than in our fake world we live in. Yeah. Um, and uh, when you actually arrive in proper job, as in our sort of jobs, <laughs> and you start you start talking about that they're, they're lying and they're not sticking to the rules and yeah. they're not and it's all the things that if you do that in the army you're gonna die yeah, yeah? especially in your life and you're like going they're not sticking to the you know they're, yeah. they're not they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing and it frustrates the hell out of you. This is what most of our society is. is that was one of the hardest things to to come to terms with having let having been in the military because you're told all the time like. As an example, if I was doing something, if I was doing a surveillance task in the military and you get asked what, what's happened, you're like that. You tell them the, exactly what's happened. Whereas I, I left and you, people just speculate. And, and I'm like, you can't speculate. You don't know whether that's actually happened. And yeah. Just tell it how it is. But we, we're creative people. People are creative and they're like making stuff up and... Lying, yeah, basically <laughs> lying. lying. You can't There's really. A nice I, way I'm of sure. Liars, I'm but. sure in the army there's plenty of lies, but when you get to the special forces, if you're lying, you could kill all your mates, couldn't you? Basically, I suppose yeah. you, you got you you got to trust each other, haven't yeah. you? When it gets to that, exactly, yeah. And it and it was. I mean, again, that's something else that's really difficult. Is I mean, a squadron of guys, twenty five, thirty guys, we work together all the all the time. It's the same guys. It's the same people, and 
you sort of you we're not all best mates that's it's far from it you know we've got a handful of mates that are my best mates but it's not that it's the fact that the nice thing is he might not be your best mate i might not want to go on the piss with him or drink beer yeah. with him but I know that when the when it hits the fan, I can count on him to be there for me, whether he's behind me, in front of me, or left or right. Do you remember your first battle combat? Was it in the SAS or was it before? No, it was in. I I spent I spent ten years, like nine, ten years in the Marines, basically traveling the world, having a great time, drinking a lot, having a laugh, playing sport, and then obviously, you know, I joined just after nine eleven, and the, the world changed a little bit, and so it was in the SAS. Yeah, I can remember it. Yeah. What, what what was it like? What was the feeling when you knew you were about uh, to go into battle? It's it's funny because you sort of like there would there had been a lot of occasions prior to that where it would it was sketchy. We'd been you know going into dodgy areas, but nothing really happened. So there was the edge was always there, and then sort of when it happened, it was like the, the adrenaline was like unbelievable. It was like a proper high. Then there was a bit of fear going on because actually when it did happen, the bloke either side of me got shot. It was just, I don't know, just by chance I didn't. And and then you're like, ah, brilliant, I've, I've, I've done it. I've been, in a, I've been in a firefight. I've done what I've actually, like, I've spent 10 odd years in, in the military training for this moment and it's happened. Mm -hmm. So there was a bit of elation. And then when it all dies down and you get back to your base and you get into bed, there's like a massive come down. You're a bit like, I'm like what was that all about? Like, okay, I need to do it again. So it's like, as a little, it can become. It's the adrenaline that's addictive, not not the not the situation itself. It would be mental to be addicted to that situation. It's the adrenaline. Does your reality change? That, by the way, if you're reading the book, when you read the book, there's lots of um, explanations of what it's like to go into into these extreme situations of of um, conflict. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's I say it's quite a hard read. It's it um, made, me, <laughs> made me quite anxious, but. Um, uh, does your reality change? Do you have a? I mean, obviously, we talk about the PTSD in a bit, a bit. But your your reality when you you're seeing stuff and you're in a war zone, does does it feel different? Yeah, it does. The one of the main reasons it does is because of the job I did. Most of the time, we worked at night, and you look, you you have night vision goggles on, and it just it basically douses the entire world in like a, a weird surreal green if you ever watch war films or or you see these computer games that people play yeah they 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 mimic the night vision look and it look, it just looks like you're looking at something through a computer screen it's it looks it's very grainy everything's got a green tint to it so it does it it probably helps with the detachment a bit of the of the mentalness of of war does things slow down when you're actually face they, to face with it? They do. It's funny. I, I, I don't know whether I describe it now. I've described it before where I remember sitting on the back of a helicopter and you can see there was gunfire. So Yeah, you do. Yeah. You, you think you're going to dodge a bullet. Yeah, you can, you can <laughs> see it coming and you're like, ah, that's going really slow. And then it just goes, <laughs> and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, maybe actually this is quite serious. Yeah, your senses must just come alive. Yeah, yeah. Because apparently was, we go through most of the day not using our senses much. But when you get into a situation like that, surely they become heightened. I've, yeah, I think definitely. Yeah. It's, smells? it's hard. Smell, you, yeah, I can... I, I miss some of the smells. I miss the, the pungent, sweaty, earthy smell of coming down from 10,000 feet in a helicopter down onto the ground. It's like a, it's like a natural indicator. You're like, oh, hang on a minute, we're, gonna, we're about to do something yeah. for real now. So you, obviously the smells pick you up, remind you of stuff as well. And, yeah. and then obviously you can see stuff and you think you can dodge it and then you can't. One of the other things you make a point in your book is afterwards you start trying to go to the gym and stuff after you've you've, you've left for a while and you're struggling with motivation. Doesn't look like you're struggling now, by the way. <laughs> you're, 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 I'm struggling this morning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that the motivation when you're when you're in the um, when you're, when you're in the special forces? You're thinking I need to be fit here because when we're when we when we get called into action, I got to stay alive. Yeah, it is. It is. It's it's sort of like it's bred into you. You, I mean, I become institutionalised, but it's still there. I just, I just, I need to do it. It's actually good for me mentally as well. You know, it makes me feel good. Yeah. It releases these endorphins and what have you. Why are we so good, our forces? Are we? Are we still I one think, of the best yeah, in the world? Hundred, yeah. And that's not. I wouldn't say. That, I'd be honest with you. If there was, you know, there are other 
countries that have really good forces, but we are head and shoulders in our mentality and mindset. I'd say we're a lot better, and I think it's down to firstly the without the British sort of mentality. Right, we are quite stubborn. Um, we're we're always the underdog, which makes us want to do better and and, and and prove ourselves and also we live in this country which is horrific weather <laughs> it makes you hard when you're out and about in this stuff it's just it is yeah we you know you know the british army and the our military train in wales yeah you can't help but be hard <laughs> <laughs> but what's it like when you're in the heat though do you, do you come, become accustomed to it quite quickly you, do, you sort of do i i get i'm I prefer the cold. Right. The heat, I get a little bit narky. I can remember, I can remember sitting on a plane, on a Hercules plane, you know, the transport planes. We yeah. were in the middle of the desert and there was literally, there weren't enough seats. Everyone was lying everywhere. I had legs over me. I had like arms over me. I was getting like super angry. And I thought someone had poured a bottle of water down my neck and they hadn't. It was just, I was sweating that much. It was just pouring down me, which made me even angrier. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's obviously uh, times in the book where you talk about casualties on our side. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that must be quite a hard thing to deal with. It's, you don't think about it at the time. You you sort of just get it's it, again everything's green haze normally, and you sort of just have to deal with it. So you're you're always thinking about what it is that you actually need to do, whether it's still the mission. Is, is a, whether you still have to achieve the mission because you haven't finished the job or you're trying to get out of an area because you've finished you know you've achieved your aim and you want to get out of there so it's it's afterwards when you sort of take stock of what's happened that it, it can become a little bit difficult because obviously they're they're your mates they're blokes that you work with how hard is it to um, then not want I'm trying to word all these questions without trying to stitch you up, basically. No. Um, but uh, to not want revenge, it must be really hard not want to go. All right, we've. <sighs> it's the, do you know what? Again, it doesn't come. It doesn't. Re that emotion doesn't come into it because once you start doing that, you'll lose. You'll lose control of yourself. Right, and you'll okay. lose. Con you'll lose focus, which you'll become like a headless chicken. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You, so it's like if you allow fear to set in properly it can become contagious and, and it can become negative where actually fear if you control the emotion is something that focuses you like you like for me i'm scared of heights so when i start doing stuff at height i'm like Whoa. but then i'm like right just concentrate on what i need to do am i doing the right thing and it's the same with like the anger it's like well there's no point right do you know what i mean I, we need to get a job done this is my stupid question really but do you, do you sometimes think i'm lucky to be alive because there's yeah quite a lot of i think so yeah been around you hasn't when there? i think about it when someone says oh yeah if, if you come close to dying i'm like well, i think i've come pretty close <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah reading your book you have um yeah. and what what's it what's it like <clears throat> then when you uh come home um and i i'll tell you a story my friend was in the marines he yeah. said what he really struggled with and he had, he learned very quickly just to shut up he'd be sitting at dinner tables he mm. got he got discharged he got um, he was injured basically yeah and he had to shut up really quickly because people start, all got their opinions on war. Yeah, like, yeah, they've never yeah. actually been there. And he yeah. said, there's just no point in talking about it in the end. Mm. But he said he used to, he, there's a lot of people at the time calling people baby killers and stuff like that. And yeah. he really struggled with it. So he mm. said, just keep your mouth shut. Don't tell anyone you're in the Marines. And, and so going, protecting your country and all that, when, when there's an anti side of it, how hard is that for, for people like you? I don't find it that hard now. <clears throat> I, I suppose I did a little bit and again, I probably did the same. I mean, I'd say I'd shut up. I'd, I've written a bloody book, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a bit too hard now. But yeah. the, in the beginning, yes. And now I just, you know, if there's a bit of a debate, I'll listen and then I'll explain to people that, you know, I did what I did because I believed in what I was doing at that time. I had to sell it to myself. I had to sell it. If you were going to do a job well, you've got to believe in it, haven't you? So, you know, the reasons we were out there at a, at a, at a point in time, I, you know, it was what I wanted to do. Is it a case in war that we have laws and rules and the oppo don't? Or does that make us a better force because we do have that? I think it makes us morally we're better because of that, because of those rules and regulations that we put in place. Moralistically, mm. it's better for us. I don't, you know, I, I, I don't know how those people deal with, you know, justifying what they do. On, you know, some people, I get it, it's a self-defense thing, but, you know, 
what goes on in the world now is pretty pretty horrific I think I know the answer to this because I think I've read the answer in your book but can you be political when you're in the army no mm. you can't because <laughs> the, you know parties yeah. change and you'll remain in that job so you're just there to do a job you're there for the lads really you're there for the people either side of you yes there's an element of patriotism I am patriotic you know I'm proud mm. to be British but um, you can't start thinking about politics you just can't <laughs> Do you have to? Do, you just have to switch off totally yeah. from it, do you? Completely. So yeah. whatever war, whatever happens, you just go right. This is my job. This yeah. is what I'm doing. I'm gonna go there. And Obviously, just... if you didn't, if if you weren't gonna buy into it, like I'm a big, you know, I sort of go by the live by the sword, die by the sword type thing. Yeah. So if you don't have that attitude, then you're probably not in the right job. Yeah. Um, could I do that job now? I, I probably would do. Yeah. You know what? It's it's interesting. Another point in it is, is you sort of, because we always think the British Army, we're the best, we're great. You know, you just pointed out we are. But the opposition aren't. They're not stupid. No, <laughs> you say no. they're learning quickly as well. Maybe. When you when you keep landing in the same place, they soon learn you're yeah. there. And then it's, you when know. You, you look, I mean, we've got God knows how much money at our disposal. Well, we haven't got that much now. But, you know, you know, research and development, the kit we've got is is awesome. And they still put up a good fight and they've got, they ain't got much. So they've got passion. They've got passion for what they believe in. Yeah, and yeah. There's a lot of other things that go in line mm. with why why they'd fight what they see as an invading force. So someone told me recently. I don't know how true you think this is that um, special forces are becoming more important because um, wars will be fought with three things. Apparently, drones, which obviously is huge now, yeah. and uh, you know you, you must see them out there all the time. Mm -hmm. um, cyber warfare. Yeah, and special forces are how wars are going to be fought. There's not going to be as many boots on the ground. Do you no. think? That, do you think it's moving that way? I think so. I think a lot of it's down to cost. You know, a conventional force is extremely, extremely expensive, and I don't know whether they're they 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 have massive purpose, but I don't know whether they're employed properly sometimes. Whereas having a smaller group of people, so as an example, like a a squadron of guys in the special forces which is essentially about 30 guys give or take that is actually it's a strategic asset it has strategic impact and actually costs less than a, an entire battalion of people right. and it has because it delivers at a strategic level you know it's commanded by ministers and top brass it has for the cost it 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 delivers more impact in your time in the forces did you see the impact drones were having yeah yeah i mean yeah we, we you, they, they they give you a massive advantage because they they're feeding all this information into you. and also i suppose they can protect you as well can they, they? Can especially you guys got, they know where you're going in and you yeah, can say we're, we're coming out bomb it or whatever yeah yeah they can they can drop ordnance bombs and whatnot they right. can they sometimes we used to use them quite a bit and that we would we would get information off them because it's obviously got a downlink where you can see what that's looking at. So right. you sort of like you get intelligence from it and when, when they work properly. I mean, I've seen one where a mountain keeps getting closer and closer. And you're like, ah, what's going on with that drone? And then it just, <laughs> and then it's, and then the snow appears and you're like, oh, it's crashed. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the, I, I, I suppose you can't tell me too much um, without, um, but what sort of things do the SAS do? Or is that you know, something you don't want to touch on really? You talk mm. about your missions a bit, but. You do not, they, they're employed in all sorts of things. You know, a lot of it is, you, you do what people call door kicking, which is raids, yeah. surveillance, you know, you'll get involved in um, sort of counter-terrorism, counter-narcotics. They, they, they're they involved in all sorts of stuff everywhere. I had a guy on Sunday brunch um, come on and talk about the special forces. The first, the first ever special forces, the SAS, was set up. Um, there were a bunch of psychos who joined in who yeah. basically quite like going around. They weren't having enough fun in the war, so they just wanted to go and go across to enemy lines. And that's how that was sort of set up. So that was the reputation. The roguish, so, yeah. yeah it's, I can't imagine you can have psychos in it now, or or, or does it appeal to them? You don't know that like a proper psycho <laughs> probably wouldn't, would be seen and like yeah. maybe pushed to one side. But you want an element of... You want someone who's got a, a sort of tendency to be to be a little bit, you know, 
roguish in his attitude. It's encouraged that you think outside the box a little bit and, you know, you think of other ways to do things that aren't quite the norm. But not, I don't think you're encouraged to be a psychopath. That would be, that would be pretty... Mm. pretty bad for everyone involved really let's talk about the PTSD then because um, it's great the way you've addressed it in the book I must say I was quite shocked right at the beginning when you started saying I was sort of thinking about my mum and stuff when I was <laughs> in, in I war I was shocked <laughs> yeah but in war and you're going wow that's not what I'm expecting you know from a book like this and mm. then and then you know it's great it's, you, I couldn't put it down then because you started <clears> talking about the mental side of things but let's talk about what it's like, first of all, mentally on on the on the front line out there, doing doing what you're doing. Um, can you start talking about missing home? You went through, a, you were going through a divorce, weren't you? And, mm. uh, and also, the bit that I was fascinated <clears throat> about, and I'd sort of written this prior to reading the book, which is, we all think you're you haven't got any feelings when you're out there. Yet you must be thinking about what's going on back home mm. when you're out for long periods of time, which you are your girlfriends, your wives, you must start worrying what's going on with them. Mm. And also, you actually mentioned in your book, whether they might be playing away. This mm. stuff is going through your head just before you're about to go into battle, yeah, one yeah. of the stories. The, the, the worst thing that happened to the army is bloody social media and the new age of technology because the first time, the first few times I'd gone away, <clears throat> excuse me, it wasn't really there. And we used to moan about that. Why in this day and age can we not contact home? And then when you can, you're like, ah, oh, I, wish it, I wish we could go back to the time when we didn't have a phone, you know, didn't have the internet. Because yeah. everything was just, you were a bit more detached, to be honest. And you could, you could concentrate more on the job at hand. Whereas once, you know, once everything came in, I, you'd have things like, your mate would phone his missus after two days and then when you eventually phone your missus, she's like, how come such and such? Oh, and you're God, like, oh, yeah. mate, you've just proper stitched me up. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. But then also you're sort of like getting involved in, you know, the washing machine breaks down, the money's run out. You're like, ah, I've got bigger fish to fry, to be honest. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I'm laughing, so, yeah. but it's, no, it's true. It's like, you know, I remember you know, we'd sit down and like all of us would be chatting about someone's oh, i'm sure she's seeing someone from brown you know and then or vice versa or all that stuff plays on your mind though yeah yeah and then because yeah. because i think that happens a lot with things like cricket those guys go on tour forever and then they start you know and everybody starts both sides go wonder what they're doing on tour and wonder what they're doing yeah, at yeah home. Exactly. there's a lot of depression in cricket i don't know if you've noticed yeah yeah that. yeah I and i think it's because they're away from home a lot and yeah. and, and it's tough when you're away because it's all that stuff's placed in your mind. but you're in life-threatening situations and as you put in your book, you're running through this sort of mm. month. I can remember i can remember the bit that you're on about as well because i can remember just literally having a proper barney on the phone. And the only reason I had the opportunity to do that was one of the helicopters had broken down. So they were like, look, we probably could take a couple of hours to fix it. And I sort of walked, we went off to get some food and I walked past this, like the welfare building, like shack. And I thought, oh, I'll just check my emails. Worst thing I ever did, ended up having a <laughs> massive Barney with my missus. She'd left me and oh gosh, she was then admitted that she was with someone else. And I remember getting back on the helicopter being like, trying to think, concentrate on one thing and then in the end I was like, just kept thinking about her and yeah. sat down at home with some dude and I'm like Ugh. so yeah it was weird but anyway a strange place to be isn't it when, yeah. you're, when, you're, when all that stuff's going through so are you able then to go professional and just switch back into mode eventually yeah I mean yeah. once someone starts shooting at you, you, you <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like you, all of a sudden you suddenly realise there's the bigger fish that's supposed to be fried yeah, yeah. <laughs> there it is yeah. right there <laughs> the bullets are flying in. so so alright so tell us about um, when the uh, PTSD when you when you first started you talk about a lot in the book when, when, it, when you first started feeling it you are quite in denial weren't you I was and it it, it was quite difficult to work out what was going on because it was people are like oh you know some people say to me did, was it did you have were you jumping under cars and did, did you realize because you kept going back to places and I was like no I didn't it was just I'd come back from being away I felt a little bit detached admittedly but I came back from being away had a few weird moments but then I was getting ready to go away again it was like another tour was coming up and I'm like a, I'm a seasoned vet apparently and I should be someone that inspires the younger lads in the squadron and what have you. But this tour that was looming in the distance, it was like four months away, just looked like a black cloud and I wasn't looking forward to it. And I'd always look forward to it. And so it was weird. 
it was a weird feeling that I wasn't comfortable with. And all I wanted to do was get rid of that being a black cloud and it to be something that I was looking forward to. And it, it didn't, it wasn't really to be the case. So at first I was just like, why do I feel like this? And, um, you know, it's not that I'm not good at my job or I've hurt myself or anything like that. I'm just not looking forward to it. I, so I, I liken it to, I, I felt like I'd lost my military mojo and I wanted to get it back because I loved that job. I didn't, I didn't know why I wasn't enjoying it. Um, how did it... So it, it, I, I don't want to ruin the whole story no. for people because I really think it's it's a really good read and I think people should do it. But but it starts driving you mad, really, doesn't it? In the end, and, and you de- you decide you're going to come come out of the military. Yeah. How are you feeling now? Now, yeah, yeah, really good. You feeling good now? Yeah, I'm not okay. a of red wine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you've had quite an exciting adventure in the last few years, you know. Yeah, so, no, it's been yeah. good. It's been. I mean, I've obviously. <clears throat> I've had to work out what it is that I need to do to make me okay, which are, which is it actually, when I look back at it, I'm like, oh, it's so easy. Why didn't I just do that in the first place? But Which is? Um, there was a, just a few things. Being honest with myself about who I am and what I am and what makes me tick. Well, you've done that in this book. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I, I, I give myself the opportunity to be more childlike, Okay. So more live in the moment as opposed to the past and stop worrying about the future so much. The thing which intrigued me a lot in it though was when you when they start putting you on on antidepressants mm. and and I I just did it for a little while and I'm a bit how you describe it. It was great, not great, but it was because that's how I, I felt my life was being numbed away from me. Yeah. And I hated it. I I just came off. I I came off mine cold turkey, which yeah. is an, which was an incredible week afterwards. <laughs> I've, got, <laughs> I've got to tell you, but the, when I was on them, I was like, "This is not me." I just no. feel weird, and I, I I don't know. I felt terrible. I, I, I I've had a few. I got given a few, and the first thought I can't really remember feeling anything. I can remember reading the side effects and being like, "I don't want. I'm, fucking, I'm scared about yeah. taking these." But then the and then I, I got given another one, and I can remember we went away. To, for a family visit and I dropped this pill and then for three days I could not hold a I couldn't string a sentence oh, together like me. I, I, felt, sl- I felt I was, smashed I had to do TV and I was slurring seriously <laughs> and I, I didn't I know that I, I read the uh, you know anyone remembers any of those shows back then when I slurred <laughs> it was good it was, I, was, I read the I read the I went online the, yeah. the, the doctor who gave them to me said I oh, don't google it because there's all the sorts of weird things on there they'll tell you and I googled it and it said Hair loss, loss of short-term memory, slurred speech. I thought I'm a TV presenter. It's kind of all the things I uh, <laughs> things I need are these, and it's like you know. <laughs> well, no, yeah, no. Mark, Mark said no one noticed. Yeah, yeah. Don't laugh. That it's not funny. Don't no, yeah, no, no. I just well, he's in control of all the devices. So <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's a weird time when you a man who's in control of everything suddenly loses a bit of control like that. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with them helping. I think it just masks something that it's not getting resolved. Yeah, it does help some some people who have chemical imbalances. For people like me, I, I'm not interested yeah, in it. Of course, but but yeah. for some people, I, I suppose it's it's one of those things. Um, right. So uh, you're feeling good now. Um, do you think it was it's a tough thing uh, for you to admit, especially in the book, and to all your the brotherhood as you call it, or your colleagues in the army, that you had PTSD? Does, is it still thought of as a failure in me with in you or everybody uh no i i now I did not you i know because I did you've done see it that, book, yeah but, um but, but no i don't think so not at all if anything it's i'm glad that i was a bad example of you know in they try to encourage people to come forward and talk about it and then i lose my job which in itself people would have been like well, I'm not going to talk about it because I'll end up with with no job, with a job without a job that I loved. And yeah. so there was, there's a, there is a point that I am a bad example, but also hopefully a good one because things have, things have changed in the organisation, and and actually I've got friends who have had wobbles, addressed them openly, honestly, and then been you know gone back into work, and they're 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 still doing that job. Yeah. So it's not seen as a failure now; it's just seen as a it's just seen as part of my life by myself and them. And I think it's also a part of the the process now. You know, it's, it's helped an organisation. Not me, not me personally, but, uh, you know, a, 
a number of them, a number of cases, and you know, the organisation that you know the the government or the military, whatever you want to call them, have sort of learnt from you know past cases and and been are now better equipped to deal with them. It's funny in the in the book because you're you're one minute you're being sort of Rambo esque as it were, and then the next minute you're really sensitive. <laughs> it's it's a it's a strange. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. You, you you wouldn't expect anyone who's put in the position of you would be as sensitive as you come across in the book. Mm. I think my past partners might disagree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, it's like a bit of a look. I am actually sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I, I suppose it's again. It just comes down to me wanting to be honest about what what I experienced emotionally, really. Okay, so you spent two years writing this book. Are you Were you worried about the, some of the things you were saying there in the book then? Yeah, a little bit. The worst bit was when I was reading it for the audio and I was like, oh, that's quite... That's not very Rambo. <laughs> I mean, there's, yeah, there's a few funny stories in there. Names and identities have been changed to protect the guilty. But, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd, yeah, there was a few of those funny stories actually where I was a bit like, oh, the blokes that know, they they know. <laughs> All right. Because yeah, you've changed um, locations and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. There's no real mention of anything like that. All the stuff that, you know, the MOD would be bothered about is actually the stuff that's pretty boring, to be honest. Right. As far as I'm concerned. What do they think about you writing a book? What do they think of all you guys who write um, books about it? Are they they're not keen. I, I would definitely say that. They're not right. very keen about it. And they... Uh, sort of they would advise against it but they know that they can't really they can stop it but they know that these things are going to come out so obviously I wrote that then I had to give the the manuscript to to the MOD right to the SF world as well and they look through it read it and then they're like look that's a little bit close we would like you to take that out this this and or not like you you're taking it out <laughs> um and so there's a little bit of to in and fro in and you know I knew that they would they want it you know I thought do you know what? What I'm going to do is just write it as it is. Yeah. And then give it to them. They're like, ah, no, take that out, take that out. You can't. Uh, and then we sort of like eventually come up with. So it actually, it's worked out really well. Oh, it is. Yeah. Uh, and what about the your, the the brotherhood as you call them or your or your um, um, fellow? They're all right. What do they think about it all? They're all they're they're okay. They're, I mean, the book. I'll, we'll find out because it's come out today, so we'll see. You yeah. Know, a little bit anxious about that. See what they say about that. But everything else, you know the. The TV stuff, they're they're pretty, they're like they're quite happy with it. Yeah, there's nothing really that we've. I would never do anything that would jeopardise people that are still doing that job. I wouldn't talk about things that the Ministry of Defence would get jittery about. So I'm I'm okay, and they're all happy with it as well. There's, I've got mates that are still in, and they're like, oh, you know, they give me a little bit of shit, but. <laughs> but good aren't they writing to you going when I get out can you get me a gig on TV it's funny that yeah yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah they all come out of the woodwork uh, how did you get your, your gig on TV then uh, right so I left I did this job that I hated mm -hmm. um, realised it was going to kill me doing that left that went into security by the way it's worth reading the book just for him taking this job on and then you then you can look at your own jobs i look at tv and go jesus Christ, i'm surrounded by those people <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah god but, uh, yeah um <laughs> i did so i then went into security which i didn't want to do i wanted to stay away from the whole bodyguarding thing not that it's a bad job i just didn't want it's not it's hard work yeah and i got a contract with an oil exec just as the price of oil crashed so that contract fell down i was skint jobless a friend of mine phoned me up and said mate i've got some biz some work can you do it i said yes it was basically me looking after i was basically an underwater cameraman's dive buddy and we were filming underwater archaeologists diving on shipwrecks looking for pirate treasure they didn't find pirate treasure they found loads of teacups i found a big bar of silver that belonged to captain kid yeah that's pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> it was all right yeah and um, yeah and that's yeah. And then obviously from the back end of that... By the way, he tells that story in the book, but it's a lot more in-depth. It's in-depth, yeah. It's and good, yeah. Yeah, but off the back end of that, you know, this this idea had come about with the channel, Channel 4, and yeah. they said, great, but where do you find these XSF guys? And this bloke was like, well, maybe you should phone this dude up. And so I got a phone call when I landed, wondering what my next job would be. And they said, you, essentially, they were like, do you want to be on TV? I was like, yeah. <laughs> uh, it wasn't like that. It, I thought it was a consultancy role, and then it turned into more of a... It was consultancy and then on screen. Do you enjoy it, the TV yeah, I stuff? Love it. I love it. 
Uh, what's it like being famous as a as someone who's? I, I wouldn't have said on that. Did you know most? You of do time, get recognised, right? Well, yeah. some people are like Come that. On. Did we go to school? I'm like, yeah. I'm yeah, I get that still. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the tube. It's so embarrassing. It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. So yeah, no, it's I just it's part of it, isn't it? I suppose you just got to roll with it. Um, but the, the TV, you know, like the the media world, TV is so the people fundamentally are so much like SF guys. Are they? Yeah. Why? Because it's not, I mean, both sides are going to hate me for that because obviously we're seen as like a bunch of right wing bloody lunatics and we, you know, the military see TV as a bit, yeah. bit sort of like, you know, bit snowflake. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not, by the way. But um, <laughs> but no, fundamentally, I mean, you know, we all like to, we like to be mega busy. We like to be perfectionists, so to speak. You want to do everything to the best of your ability, deliver decent stuff. You like a million different things going on at the same time. You like to keep your mind busy. You like to travel. And then when you get a chance to let your hair down, you let your hair down properly. So fundamentally, they're almost identical. It's just beliefs, opinions. and Was it, was it a nice thing that when you did the show, suddenly you realised how much people love the... I mean, I'm sure you know how much people love the Special Forces, but even more so after I, you're doing the show. I didn't realise, to be honest. Did, I didn't... Do, do they not... Do the people in Special Forces not know that? No, nah, it's because it's so... There's no... No one knows anything about it, really. And, you know, part of me, when I when I got offered it, I was like, well, some if I don't do it, someone else is going to do it. They'll get someone else. So that was my... That was part of my argument when I spoke to the Ministry of Defence. And... um and then I didn't really know how it was going to go down. We did. I remember we did the shoot, and you, we were like, we "Don't really know." One of the directors was like, "This is going to be massive," and we're like, "Yeah, whatever." <laughs> like, we we generally, honestly, we were like, oh, yeah, "Yeah, I'm sure it will be." And then yeah, and then it was like, "Whoa, what the?" Yeah. And then you know you it's get great. a lot of good feedback, and it was there's like not a lot of bad press. There's a little bit, but it's been all right. It's been it's been mental, mm. <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. Was it were you regarded as a as a, a, a top soldier? Is that how they regard you in the in the military? Well, yeah, I suppose. And then do they keep that thought when you leave or do you just do, is there any contact? Do do they do they keep in contact with you? My Are mate, they like your well well is it like your family forever? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean like, you know, there's a contact that's in you know, in the headquarters that mm. I have to talk to and I have to keep him abreast of a few, you know, I spoke to him about this book. That was a headache of his for a bit. The T, you know, SAS, who dares wins. Every time that comes about, we've got to, you know, I have to write a request to be involved in that and promise that I'm not going to talk about any secrets and what have you. And then he gets to see little bits of it or that, that department do. So I'm always talking to them, but then, you know, when I first left, because of those reasons, the mental health reasons, I totally cut it away. I disappeared off the face of the planet as far as they were concerned, which is another reason, which which is another thing that affected me even more. And now I'm actually, you know, I'm closely in touch with guys that are still in do all the time. Should, do you think they should do more of that then, keep people in contact with each other? They are trying harder, I suppose, aren't they, at the moment? They are trying a lot harder. They're, they're, they're getting a lot better. But it is about contact. It is about keeping in touch. Yeah. And keep, just keeping an eye out for each other, do you know? I suppose we've been in conflict now for a long, long enough time that mm. there's a lot of guys out there with PTSD. Yeah, and also because it's slowed down a little bit now. You know, the, we're not as heavily involved in these areas anymore. So, every when you're in it, it's, it's you're just in it. It's when it slows down for me. It's when it when it all stopped that that's really you know okay. I felt that dark cloud and all that, but when it actually stopped, that's what really. That's when it really went mad. Yeah, because you do mention the word in there, it defined me. Yeah. Which is what I've talked about quite a lot in this podcast with sport and stuff like that, mm. when the footballers retire and all that. It's also, not only do they lose all the camaraderie and all that stuff, they, it also, they were something, a footballer. You were, yeah, you know, there's a lot of kudos. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, and suddenly you lose that, and who are you then? Mm. I think we, I mean, my, my, I started up an organisation with a mate of mine, Jamie, who's actually mentioned, he got a little piece in there, actually. In and, the book, yeah. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> we sort of predominantly deal with veterans and their dependents, you know, their families, but we have also dealt with, like, pro sports people, mm. um, people from the emergency services, you know, all these people, you know, that have quite long careers that, are, you know, there's a kudos that goes with those careers, and then when it finishes, they're like, who am I? Mm. Where, where do I get that changing room banter again? Where do I, you know... 
where do I get that feeling of either running onto a pitch or being being someone, being a, a, a youthful mm. individual? And when you did the um, program um, Meet the Drug Lords inside the Real Narcos, um, what was it like doing stuff like that, moving into sort of that, that side of the TV industry? I loved it. Did you? Yeah, I really loved it. I wanna, I'm hopefully going to be doing more. We're looking at stuff now, but that's probably what I really love the most. Why? I don't know. It's like going away, meeting people, getting to understand people that I wouldn't normally meet. Sometimes people I would have been fighting against, but mm. it's just, a, again, I find it, it is quite enlightening to go and see those places. It's, it's adrenaline, bit of adrenaline. But do you ever think though that, um, are you ever in the situation where you're looking at this going, this is just ridiculous that we've made all this stuff so illegal that this lot are doing or again, can you not get involved in the politics? I'm not talking about the documentary. I'm talking about when you're actually when yeah. you when you're actually doing it in the in the army in the spa, um, special. Um, again, when you're doing it, you don't. It's a job. Yeah, that is that is it. It is a job. It's and it is guys. that cleaning. It is that clean cut. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. It's a job. It's only now when you you know I've been out and done that documentary and looked at it, you're like, oh, is there a better way of doing this? Maybe we're fighting this war on a on the wrong level maybe we should fight it socially you know with education infrastructure investment in faraway places with forgotten people there's a lot more to it than just tooling up an army and sending them in i'd peter blexley on here who's um that uh policeman um copper who was uh playing clothes for years and uh does the program hunted now on, on the yeah, yeah yeah such yeah a, such it. a great guy but he said on here he said he, i spent all these years <clears throat> trying to catch the drug dealers and you know, uh, infiltrate them and do that. And he goes, and I just think it's a waste of time. We shouldn't be doing it. It's like, <laughs> and he's like, he said, I spent all my life doing that. By yeah. the way, listen to that podcast because he's brilliant. Hopefully he's going to come back soon as well, which is, uh, which I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to. Um, yeah. So talking about that though, when you just, when you're just trying to, uh, yeah, you're just doing what the orders tell you to do and all that sort of stuff. It, it the, I don't want to get all sort of Alan Partridge here. You know, what's it like to kill a man sort of thing? But it was like, you, you do you do discuss on it uh, a few bits where, because you, you do cover it, which is amazing. It's mm. like, I wondered whether you would go through talking about it, how you sort of managed to detach yourself from that actual mm. stuff which is going on when you look at dead bodies and when you see dead bodies and you don't know whether you've hit them. And you mm. don't, uh, was it a tough thing to put in a book? Nah, I don't think it was. I think it was it needed to be in there because it is essentially that's one of the things that can affect people. Um, I know morally I always acted in the right way when it came to stuff like that, and I don't think it really it was it was a case of you know that we go into this whole them and us thing, but it is literally that it's a job that you do. It's an unfortunate byproduct of a job that I loved. It's weird that you I have a job that I love with something that's quite pretty gritty, really. Yeah. And it wasn't it wasn't that I loved that at all and, and far from it, but it wasn't something that I was gonna dwell on too much because I knew that the decisions I'd made were right. What did affect me was the the sort of psychological impact you have on everyday people that are just unfortunately mingling around in that mm. area that you're fighting in. And you see, you know, I think I spoke about the deadpan expression on a child's face. They're yeah. that shocked that there's no noise, nothing. <clears throat> They're just like and I remember not at the time, I didn't didn't really take it in, but it was a bit later where I was like, that's, you know, that's quite hard. There, there's someone there that that's, I don't, you know, they're an innocent young child. I wouldn't want my kids to see that. Yeah, the sort of way you described it, which I thought was quite good, is is when you were looking at the dead bodies or anything, it was a, you were saying you are a bit detached from it, like it was a TV or, or, or a movie. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Because that's how you have to go through, I suppose. I think it is just a natural coping mechanism. Yeah. And then you talked about children with your kryptonite. And I suppose that's when reality hits you, when you see a child. Mm. That is it. I think, I reckon a lot of it's to do with age. Like, that job is a young man's game. And obviously, as we get older and we have families and we pro we're aware of our mortality, then you start overthinking stuff. And that's why, you know, that's why we, that's why you get PTSD and stuff like that. Yeah. Probably. And it's, I just... There was things that happened in my life that made me think about what it was we were involved in. You know, I had a kid, she wasn't very well, that sort of thing made me more emotional. And do you think that there's a humour involved in, uh, there must be for you guys? 
Oh, it's, yeah, it's horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's brutal, honestly. I just imagine it is, yeah, because to survive that. Some guys, you, you know, some guys, before we'd go out on it, this is dark, by the way, but some guys, before you go out, were like getting ready, kitting up and waiting to travel out to the helicopter and get on it and, you know, think about what it is that we're going to be doing that night. You'd, you'd be guys like going, little did Foxy know that this was the last time he was going to crap into porcelain. I'm like, mate, oh, that's God, funny. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's their way of doing like, their yeah, dark humor, I know, but yeah. I never entered into it because I was always like, oh, that's not funny, man. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. man. So there's some weird humour going on, yeah. Yeah, that must be, uh, A, must be hard, but B, no, not hard, but you must miss that sort of stuff then when you... When I do, you yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we still, I'll meet up with the lads and I'm like, remember when you used to joke about that? And they're like, yeah, that was pretty harsh, wasn't yeah. it? And I'm like, mate, that was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where where were, how many how many times did you actually have to go out on missions, do you think, in a, in a total in your... In your <sighs> Was it, was it like just weekly you were going out all the time? On You'd own? be away, so a lot of the tours are like six months. I did a nine-month once, but six months. And on average, probably, you'd be going out maybe when it was at its height, like almost every other night. Mm. Um, otherwise, averaging is like three or four times a week. Which, you, you know, you didn't really know what you were going into. Sometimes you'd get into a scrap. Sometimes it would be absolute sheer boredom. Which is the, is the emotional roller coaster, being away. And what about sleep deprivation? Because it, it's hard to sleep, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and it's the military had you'd pride yourself on on not and being able to operate on hardly any sleep. It used to be this macho thing. Well, I've only had two hours sleep. I'm all over it. And actually, yeah. when you look when you come away from step away from it, and you look at what sleep deprivation does to you, you know, a, you know. 24 hours without sleep and you're the equivalent of like something like five times over the limit drink yeah. driving because of you know your mind's just not firing on all cylinders so and then add to that that you're carrying around a weapon and expected to make split sef- second decisions it's quite it's bizarre like when i'd go away on tour and i would probably sleep four hours in 24 Something like that, wow. and, and get up and train, and you know we used to get sent out super strong coffee. Yeah, and yeah, and, yeah. But you, and, you voluntarily got up in, early in the morning to train, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a few, there was like three or four of us that were like into it. Did you used to hang out with the American forces as well? Yeah, we did a lot of work with the Yanks. Yeah, good, good, good guys. guys. Yeah, you all yeah, friends yeah. when you're out there. Yeah, really good. They're good. They they put a lot of time and effort into being out there and they they're very much of the they're, they're good at what they do they got a lot of cash that's why we're their friends um <laughs> do they have better rations than us they got better rations they honestly they had like they'd have like a fridge full of co- coca-cola that ben and jerry's on tap so we'd always go over to the americans and really you know, yeah they, like if you're on the main base every thursday was um surf and turf steak and lobster wow yeah i know i know i know what do they think of us um Miserable. Us, look at me putting myself in your. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, they just, you know, miserable bastards, always, <laughs> always whinging, but actually get the job done. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, there's, a, a, there's a there's mutual respect there. We have a good laugh with them, actually. Yeah. Um, is it, it my my mate who's um, who, the one I was talking about earlier is the marine? I went for a walk with him just to jump around the. Uh, I can't remember where we went now. Peak districts or something. Yeah, yeah. The amount of preparation we had to do for that. <laughs> was unbelievable yeah, and yeah. he went no 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 he had a checklist with him and he went through it and he went through all my kit bag make sure we're, we're already staying in a cave for a night he goes <laughs> he goes we're not going to go up there and get caught in the wet we are prepping because you know i'm not carrying you down yeah, that's yeah. it and i and he went you learn this stuff tim you've got to prepare and then nothing how, is that how you still go through life yeah a little bit i think we're <laughs> i think we're the sort of when we do that show like the production company oh, I've, <laughs> and we're like, oh, right, you need to have this done, this done. And when it's not done, we're like, we lose our shit. And yeah. Yeah, I think they, they have a love hate relationship with us. But yeah, it's all about preparation. Prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. performance yeah. Yeah. Go. yeah. Do you like it when the public come on your show and they're crap and they've all got, they've got like the big ego and then it's, yeah, it's awesome. Gets... <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. We've just done the stand up to cancer one as well. So yeah. that was even better because it was celebs. How much, how much, oh, which ones? Can you tell or not? Okay, yeah, no. all right. Um, how much of it is mental and how much is physical then? When you're pushing yourself through on that. 
You don't need to be that fit. You, well, that's, that's a load of crap. You've got to you've got to be physically robust. That doesn't mean you're super strong or anything. You've just you know if you go over on your ankle, you don't bust it. You know that sort of thing. But it's all to do with your head. You know I that selection. I turned up 350 people. I'm 25 years old. There's a few girl guys older than me, a few guys younger than me. Some guys are like massive, ripped up, and you're like they're going. You're doubting yourself, going. I don't, yeah. you know, maybe am I, am I, have I prepared? And actually, I hadn't prepared because it was just after Christmas. So I'd been drinking. I'd, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, I was carrying a bit of timber. But, um, you know, once after about three weeks, they're not there. They've gone. Mm. All these like superhuman individuals or think they're, they've gone because they didn't really want to be there. Mm. They were doing it because of a, it was a status thing as opposed to actually wanting to do that job. Mm. Do you still have thoughts about being in? No. conflict and stuff does it oh as in like does, cropping does, up into my mind yeah does it come back I think about it every now and again yeah it depends what I'm doing it depends if anything's reminded me but it's okay now yeah 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 it's just it is like you know I think about it and yeah that was that it's, it's just a building block to where I am now mm. and you loving your life uh, the, the rowing challenge as well yeah, that, yeah, I didn't love that. <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah, Some that quite was, gruesome bits in that, especially was, to do with your bottom. But oh, yeah. that was oh, that. yeah, my mate. I was literally, literally. Oh, but, Go mate, on, tell us the story. Go on. One with my backside, and I'm like, you're gonna have to have a look at it. He's like, so on there, like, on where are you side. rowing? First of all, tell everyone where oh, you're rowing. Right. So we rowed from Portugal, Lagos in Portugal, and we rowed to Venezuela. Venezuela. So Why? <laughs> Well, I got drunk and that's how I got involved. <laughs> uh, we did it, yeah, did it for did it for charity. Yeah. Um, it was actually something that did save me mentally, I think. Yeah. But it was it was long. Yeah, go it, on. Fifty days. We, we were the first people to row from mainland Europe to mainland South America. Mm -hmm. It's in the Guinness Book of Records, apparently. Well, it is. I've seen it. You've done quite a lot. You've done that. You've d discovered. Um, Captain um, oh, Kids, kids yeah. Treasure. Yeah, you've done quite a bit in your time. Go oh, on, so, so your, your, your bum's hurting you. Oh, the bum thing, yeah. <laughs> so obviously there I am, laid on my side, pulling my ass cheeks apart, and my mate Aldo is like, oh, mate, really? He goes, you've got a boil, and it was right next to my hoop. And So literally, <laughs> so the next week, he had to like administer my first day to this like Lancet every morning. And I'm uh, there, losing my dignity. <laughs> but I'd rather lose my dignity than have to lance my own. Boil, Boil yeah. yeah. Do you do? I, I suppose when you're when you're out and you're in missions and stuff, I suppose there's not a lot. Of, you you can't be shy, can you? If, no. The, when you're with all your mates, that was that's the point that we've made the on the last sort of SAS thing we did was you know the mixed. We've done a mixed one, men, male and female, and it was about it. It wasn't about the toughness of the job, you know, the physicality of it. It's about the uncomfortableness. You know, I've been in an observation post. In a, living in a hole with four guys and I uh, I take a shit in a bit of cling film next to me mate wrap it up put it in the top of my backpack it's, you've got to get over that stuff it's those uncomfortable moments that are the hardest the unglamorous bits that are the hardest part of the job wow mm. talking about that you're doing <laughs> doing mixed um, here we go, here the, we go. It, was, well, it, was, <laughs> it was it was announced this week that uh, women are now going to be accepted into the special forces I imagine uh <sighs> How do we go around this? It's, I because I, I, I imagine the problem with it is is that I'm reading your book. It's so wonderful because you talk about the mental side of everything. Adding that into the ball into the mix. I don't want to stitch you up here, so no, I don't no. know if you don't want to answer it, it's fine. No, but no. adding adding women into the into the mix might be quite hard when it, at the moment it's a very male dominated. There's 30 guys. We're going out. We're on missions. How how do you the, how do you see it? The argument that people keep coming up with is women can do the job and I'm like, ah, of course they can. There is going to be millions of women that are strong enough, hard enough, physically and mentally. It's not about that. It's whether men and women can do that job together. You know, yeah. the dynamic that that spins and I, I haven't got the answers. I can't say whether it will, they will or they won't, but it will cause a lot. There will be issues arise from it. And if, and if it affects... If men and women working together affects a unit, a unit's operational output, then I would suggest no, they shouldn't. I imagine they can, but in the future. 
if you just throw throw it all together now, I think it could be quite complicated. But I think yeah, it, it will do. We've got the society has to change. It's you know, it's, yeah. it's got a long way to go before we're 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 comfortable with that. But we all were uncomfortable when women first started joining the army, weren't we? And now it's it's yeah, it's, 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 it's fine. Yeah, it's you know, work, yeah. everyone it's, just it's understands it. Just, yeah, so you've it's got to iron it out. It's got yeah. it's got to be done, and then see how it goes. Test and adjust. <clears throat> and I suppose, as we mentioned earlier wars changing because of the drones because of the cyber because the boots on the ground and stuff mm. so i suppose there's different dynamics happening that's it yeah i bet it's funny because there's a lot there's obviously a lot of women that are, you know this needs to change and i bet the um the women that are married to the guys that are in at the moment aren't too keen for it to change oh uh, yeah okay so there's that, as well. that side of things yeah yeah because you do mention that as i mentioned earlier on in the podcast about that relationships you're still a human. Yeah. When you're out there and you're doing your job, you're still a human. You can't switch it off. No, no. Yeah, because obviously you talk about your child in there and stuff and, and yeah. how you want to be back at home. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. It's, you, everyone's, still a everyone's human. Like, ah, all these, like, you do all this super special force stuff. And you're like, oh, yeah. I was still born a kid. Yeah. I still have the same thoughts as everyone else. Yeah. Feelings, whatever. Listen, um, I ask everyone who comes on this podcast the same questions. So if you don't mind, I'll run through these with you. What one piece of advice would you like to give our listeners that has been invaluable to your life? Be honest with yourself. If you're going to lie to someone, don't lie to yourself because you know you're lying and it will do your head in. And maybe you've taken that one step further by being honest with everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> is, it, is there an element of um, feeling a bit more free because you've said done... Oh, you don't know the response of this book yet, but no, I mean, no, no, basically, because yeah. you put it all in there, do you feel, does it feel freeing? Yeah, it's, it's good that it's out there. I hope people will get something from it. Hopefully that bit of advice will come sing through in that, mm. maybe. Uh, what's the biggest mistake you've made? Never made mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have you met? Have you made any? Have you made? Have you been on the in a on a mission going? Oh no! What oh, about? Let's have a think about. That. I've got. There's a funny story. I don't know whether I wrote in that because it is mega embarrassing. <laughs> As a soldier, it's mega embarrassing. And you know, I just finished selection. I've joined a squadron. Yeah. You know, and and that's a big come down as well. You like you finish selection. You, there's eight of you, ten of you left after after 350 people. And you're like, I am the dog's obvious. And then you join a squadron and there's all these proper battle-hardened lads that are like, ah, shut the fuck. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh. Anyway, we, it was one of the first things. It was a training job. We're all in our, you know, that black kit that looks mm. quite menacing. We're balaclavered up. We're in a, in a room that's a really small room, but it's got like about 40 guys in there, crammed in there. I've got a shotgun. I'm down on one knee and that blokes are waiting to go. We're waiting to do a training serial. And I'm like reloading the shotgun and I'm like, hold, hold, which means wait. And everyone's like, hurry up, hurry up. And then I'm, I'm trying to rack the shotgun and it, and it jams. I don't know what's wrong with it. And I can't quite see what's going on. And I'm like, hang on a minute. And then the bloke that's running the range comes over and he's like, let, let me have a look. So no one can tell who anyone is. Gets his torch out and he's like, Ooh, it would help if you put the, the bullets in the right way round. And, I'll just, <gasps> and, then and I still to this day think he was lying. But literally everyone was like, Ooh, I could hear people screaming and shouting, going, who is it? Who is it? And he's like, who is it? And I was just like, oh, well, no. And I was like, it's Foxy. And they were like, Ooh. and obviously one of my mates that had just joined the squadron with was at, I could hear him howling. And I knew, and he even said after he goes, I'm so glad that wasn't me. Right. So not a mega bar embarrassing moment, but it was at the time. It was horrific. Brilliant. Uh, any life hacks? You must have some a good hack for us to go through our lives with. A life hack? I mean, uh, Something about like travel tips or, you know. I'm the whole, f everything about life for me is I just want to have a good time, fun. I'm not fussed about anything else other than just having a laugh. I suppose you've got seen death. So you still have a laugh out there doing that stuff. You're yeah, but I mean, joking. you've you've seen it, so so you know how important life is. Yeah, I whereas the, the rest of us are so immune from it, we don't we don't see it at all. So so, it's not, you know. no matter what I'm doing, whether it's travel, anything, I, all I want to do is have a laugh. Mm. Uh, apart from your own, any any, uh, is there a book you recommend? I'm quite into boring people would find them not that. I'm quite into factual 
books really so am i do you, do you, are you allowed to take books when you go out on yeah, the, yeah 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 i don't read that much fiction i'll read a little bit read a bit of uh lee child i quite like jack reacher um <laughs> uh, but i do there's a book called chasing the scream that i'm sort of nearly done at the moment that's about the history of the war on drugs oh. fascinating okay really 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 interesting dark All right. um i'm into that history side of things there's another really really good book called ghost wars which is about Afghanistan, the rise and fall of, you know, AQ and all that sort of thing. But they're the What's sort of AQ? Books, Al-Qaeda. All right. You know, the start of Bin Laden and mm-hmm. that relationship with Afghanistan and the Middle East and America and Pakistan. It's quite fascinating what if you, you're into that. What did you do for entertainment when you were out there? When I'm out? Oh, out, out there. there. Uh, yeah. Just did absolutely hammer each other. There's a <laughs> lot. There's an awful lot. I mean, there's a bit in there when we talk about the, the box of doom. Yeah. Where someone had made a mistake and we made him pay for it. There was a lot of, yeah, that stuff like that, more more bantery sort of. But do you, uh, you get it, a bit of TV. Is there TV? Yeah, and what's yeah. it, American it was TV? The end. No, American it's got stuff. Sky. Yeah. Yeah, watched a lot of foot, football. football. Love the football, yeah. Any, uh, who do you support? <laughs> Arsenal. Mm-hmm. Any, uh, they're they're any doing all right at the moment. Card scores or anything? He'd have to. Oh, darts. Do, did a lot of darts. darts. Played darts. I'm rubbish at darts. Uh, did a lot of. You, you sort of become the dice men. We have like these two big dice. You're not allowed to call them dice when you're in. They're called mice. It's a rule. If you call dice, you're in trouble. Right. And you used to roll. And any decision that needed making, you'd roll the dice. Really? Yeah, it was awesome, yeah. Like literally, you know, forfeits, punishments, the dice get rolled. Oh, that's kind of... Yeah, making co- everything down from making comes coffee. D- I, I, I mean, it's not the same, but I worked in a restaurant years ago and every decision by the staff there was done on dice because the dice man had come out and we were all reading the yeah. book, you know. Yeah, it's oh, quite, that's right. It's, yeah, quite, it's good. It's yeah. quite addictive, isn't yeah, it, that yeah, book? Yeah. Um, and um, <clears throat> when you watch TV or movies, the war movies, um, what do you make of them? Some of them are good, yeah. Uh, I really like, so modern day type ones, Zero Dark Thirty is pretty pretty awesome. I don't know that one. The la- it's about it's the last forty five minutes of the SEAL team guys that went in and got Bin Laden and Oh uh, right, yeah, okay. Catherine Bigelow is the is the director and she is nailed I mean there's a couple of inaccuracies, but she's nailed the atmosphere. If you want to know what it's like to be on the ground as an SF soldier, watch that film. Really? Yeah, yeah good. I'm i I'm like I always like whew. Gets right. me going when I watch it. As in, like, just, just gets you of, going. You want to be there, well, or gets you going. Like, like, you don't in, want to be. You're there. in that moment. The just how she. I don't know how she does it, but as she's done a very good job. Good advice, really? but she's captured it. Yeah, really. What, good. About, what about the big Hollywood ones? Because you mentioned Rambo in your book. What about that? Do Love like Rambo. That yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's a legend. He? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is over. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Final final question. Um, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> <laughs> uh, again just have a laugh just have a laugh <laughs> just have a laugh yeah yeah life's I hate it when there's too much seriousness, seriousness going on life's too short to take it too seriously have you always been like that or do you think it's because I of... think so I think it sort of went against me for a little bit when, I'm, when you're trying to establish yourself in a military career but yeah you know I think that was another reason I went on selection and to join the special forces was you can you're, you can be yourself pretty much yeah would you recommend people go in and join? I would do, yeah. If it's the right thing, for, it was the right thing for me. You know, I needed that. I needed. I wasn't an outgoing person. I was quite quiet, quite easily led. Couldn't look after myself. Didn't know me arse from me elbow. So I needed that. And it worked for me. I've got to say, I thoroughly enjoyed the book. I recommend anyone listening to this to to go and read it. It's a, you talk about a director, whoever that was, just a minute ago, because I can't remember who. Captain Bigelow. Yeah, that was yeah. it. Um, uh, how she captured it. reading this book you really it makes me anxious but you also really explain what it's like to actually be in in uh, war zones and so it's, it's a really good job well done Jason thanks very much thanks for coming on today no I appreciate it uh, if thanks anyone so wants much. to follow you you're on Twitter but you've got a weird name haven't you Jason underscore Carl underscore Fox right yeah. uh, anywhere else they can follow you or is that what you're doing at Twitter, the moment, Twitter? Insta, and Instagram as well Insta's the same yeah okay thanks same. so much mate mate thanks a lot awesome top man cheers Cheers.